Much of the healthcare debate is centered on the fundamental aspects of access. Namely, is healthcare a right, such as the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Or is it simply a privilege that is conferred upon those who can afford it? Our current system primarily endorses the latter perspective while also supplementing it with government intervention in the form of subsidized health plans, such as Medicare and Medicaid. However, recent activities in the House and Senate might suggest a paradigm shift in the way that the United States administers healthcare. With five more yays than nays, the Affordable Health Care for America Act passed with House, at the House of Representatives on November 8th of this year. Now until the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act in the Senate, a tougher road, road lies ahead as the original House bill becomes amended into submission. However, if all goes to the Democrats' plan, a new health care bill will, will provide access to the estimated 51 million uninsured Americans, in theory that is. Indeed, the Affordable Health Care Act would establish an affordable public option insurance plan to supplement already existing, but often exclusive, private insurance plans. But there is a fundamental flaw. How will the 51 million new owners of an insurance plan get treatment if 61 million already insured Americans simply do not have access to primary care physicians? The simple answer is that they won't. And this will especially be the case if we continue to see the same trends in the dwindling number of medical students interested in primary care. So what is primary care and why is it so important to our healthcare system? Primary care can best be envisioned through the eyes of one Dr. Cox. If you don't immediately get this pop culture reference, Dr. Cox is a vehemently egotistical character on a TV series called Scrubs, which depicts <laughs> the humorous lives of several doctors. More importantly, however, Dr. Cox specializes in internal medicine. Uh, which means he attends to patients of various age, condition, and socioeconomic status. Primary care refers to physicians that practice internal medicine, family medicine, geriatrics, and pediatrics. It also encompasses phys physician's assistants and other clinical practitioners that provide general care. On average, primary care physicians provide 52% of all ambul ambulatory care visits, 80% of pulmonary disease and diabetes, and 69% of visits for both uh, for hypertension. This means that, generally speaking, they are the first physicians that you will encounter if you have any non-traumatic injury or illness. However, primary care physicians make up only one-third of the U.S. physician workforce. This is a problem when one considers that primary care physicians are essential to an efficient healthcare system. Without access to a primary care provider, patients go directly to the emergency rooms, which translates to a cost of $18 billion a year. If half the physicians work, uh, if only half of the physician workforce were made up of primary care providers, healthcare costs would be drastically reduced. However, several factors pose a significant challenge to expanding primary care. In 2007, the median debt of your typical med school student was $140,000. In 2008, debt levels reached a median of $155,000. That's an 11% increase in just one year. Now consider that an orthopedic surgeon earns an average of $436,000 $436,481 a year. In the light of that fact, you might rightfully think that a student that decides to enter orthopedic surgery would have relatively few problems with paying off their debt. Now consider that the average salary of a family medicine physician is $188,271, nearly 45% less than the orthopedic surgeon. So, if you were a medical student that received the same training as all of your peers, would you be more inclined to enter an orthopedic surgery residency or a family med medicine residency? The choice seems obvious, and unfortunately far fewer students are choosing family medicine or any other primary care residencies. A survey of fourth-year students at 11 U.S. medical schools in the spring of 2007 reported that 23.2% were most likely to enter careers in internal medicine. However, only 2.2% 2 .2 reported that they were likely to enter careers in general internal medicine. That means that most would subspecialize in something like cardiovascular disease, thus deviating from the broader practice of primary care, which is encompassed in the general internal medicine. Therefore, we can see that as medical school debts continue to increase, while primary care salaries stay stagnant, fewer students will choose primary care. So how do we address the problem that is entirely rooted in the economics of medical education and the healthcare billing system? Well, addressing such complex issues is best left to the intellectual prow prowess of our legislature, but the answer can be much simpler. Why not provide economic and social incentives to students early on in exchange for their commitment to primary care? And how early, you ask? How about during their undergraduate education? That is exactly what the Cicely B. Williams Undergraduate Development Program for Primary Care Physicians, I gotta shorten that because that's her <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> or the Williams Program, for short, aims to do. Dr. Cicely D. Williams was born in 1893 in Kew Park, Jamaica. She passed away at the sprightly age of 99 in 1992. Dr. Williams is best known for her work, at work with infant-related health issues in the Gold Coast of Africa. She was later appointed to the head of Mother and Child Health at uh, the World Health Organization. The Williams Program de is dedicated to her tenacious pursuit of equitable care for all the world's sick. But what exactly does it consist of? The Williams Program will select 10 undergraduate students with an initial interest in primary care and supply them with an innovative curriculum designed to explore the ethical, social, and economic aspects of primary care. Additionally, the Williams Scholars, as they will be called, will receive full coverage of the cost of their, for their preparation for the Medical School Admission Test, or MCAT, as well as access to periodic tutoring sessions and admissions counseling. The Williams scholars will, the scholars will not be educated in the clinical aspects of primary care, since that's left to the medical schools. Rather, they will explore, for example, ethical, ethical dilemmas that arise during the practice of a primary care specialty. The curriculum will consist of a weekly lecture by leaders in the primary care community, followed by a small group discussion during the same week. One of the greatest assets of this program, however, will arise from mentorships that the students will engage in with primary care physicians in the surrounding area. Various studies show that aside from financial debt, the other factor that turns students away from primary care is their experience with their mentors during internships. Therefore, the role of the educator is key in encouraging interest in primary care, and Williams scholars will be prepared with truly influential primary care mentors. And that's kind of where I'm at.